Dead America, The Second Month, The SoCal Mission Part 4 Written by Derek Slayton Narrated by Aaron Smith Chapter 1 31 Hours Remain The sun was high in the sky, showering the group with warm rays, clear and blue as far as the eye could see. Normally, they would have welcomed the beautiful weather, but after spending the better part of the previous two hours clearing a bridge so they could cross it, even the sun was taking its toll. Charlie sat on the hood of an SUV, taking a break from the grueling work. The road was packed with cars, lined up almost bumper to bumper. Former occupants clawed at the windows, still trapped inside having tried to flee to what they'd hoped would be the safety of a sparsely populated state park. They'd been wrong. As Charlie sat, he looked at the vehicle in front of him, a light blue sedan with a broken tail light, a touch of blood around it like it had backed into one of the ghouls. Inside there was constant movement, three distinct figures thrashing about, apparently angry they couldn't get out. One of the creatures seemed fixated on Charlie pressing its ghoulish face against the back window. The month of constant heat inside the vehicle causing the flesh to begin to peel off, sticking to the glass. Despite how grotesque the sight was, he couldn't look away. Hey, you done with your break or what? Private Garrett huffed. A few more cars and we're back on the road. Yeah, I'll be right there, Charlie replied, and took a swig of water before hopping down. Garrett nodded and headed back to the bridge. As Charlie made his way back, he detoured to the edge of the drop-off, which fell about fifty yards into a gorge. He looked across to the other side as Sergeant Wrangle and Private Cohen pushed a car off of the bridge and down the side. The car picked up steam before crashing into a pile of discarded vehicles below. Charlie couldn't help the smile on his face, getting some satisfaction out of the display. Enjoying the show! Garrett called from ahead. Oh yeah, it's great, Charlie replied as he continued his walk back. Reminds me of watching one of those bad drive-in movies. The private barked a laugh. Yeah, only thing missing was the car exploding halfway down, he added. You seem to know your way around those explosives, Charlie quipped. You sure you don't want to rig one up? Wish we had the time, my friend, Garrett said wistfully, shaking his head. Wish we had the time. The two of them walked back to the bridge as Corporal Reed and Private Preston approached, the former sporting a bloodied bandage covering his bite wound. There were two more cars left sitting right beside each other, blocking the path. When they'd arrived, the entire bridge was packed like this, with no way to get around it due to the gorge. The four men circled the vehicles, doing a deep check for monsters inside. I got movement in this one, Preston said, and Reed pulled out his handgun, tapping on the driver's side window. A few seconds later, the ghoul in the back seat climbed to the front, pressing its face against it. Like the one Charlie was observing, its skin felt the effects of being hotboxed for the last month. Okay, before I shoot, what's everyone's guess? Reed asked, his hand on the door. Charlie's brow furrowed. Guess about what? he asked. Bite or blood type? Reed replied. That's morbid, Charlie said hoarsely. Garrett smacked him on the back, a jovial gesture, but the expression on his face clearly conveyed that with Reed's mortal wound, he could deal with it any damn way he pleased. I'm going to bite, Charlie finally said. All right, we got ourselves a player, Reed quipped. Preston? The private shrugged. Give me blood type, he said. Garrett, you're the tiebreaker. What's your fancy? Reed asked. Garrett exaggerated, stroking his chin in thought, and then raised a finger. Blood type, he finally said. All right, it's time to play everyone's favorite game, bite or blood type, Reed bellowed in a faux game show host voice, and aimed his shot, pulling the trigger. The window blew right out, and so did the back of the zombie's head. When they were sure it was down for the count and that it was alone, Reed opened the door. The body smacked into the pavement, and the corporal leaned over to have a look at it. Well, 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 let's see what we got here, 
he said. No torn clothing, no visible wounds. Looks like blood type is the winner. Preston threw a victory fist into the air. Woo! he cried. What do I win? You win one more car to push all the way to the other side of this bridge, Reed said with a flourish and a bow. Preston wrinkled his nose. Doesn't seem like much of a prize, he muttered. What if I let you be the one who pushes it off of the cliff? the corporal asked, cocking a brow. Preston contemplated for a moment, and then nodded. Okay, I'll take it, he said, and got into position. Thanks for playing, everyone. We'll see you in the next round, Reed concluded in his over-the-top voice. Is everybody enjoying the break time? Wrangle barked as he approached with Cohen in tow. Yeah, what the hell? the private snapped. Sorry, Sergeant, Charlie said quickly. I asked if we could play bite or blood type. Wrangle glared at the soldiers, knowing it had been one of them that had suggested it. They were low on time, but taking the time to yell at them would waste even more of it. Did you win? he asked Charlie dryly. Nope, I did, Preston said, raising a hand. Well, congrats, the sergeant snapped. Now get to pushing. Reed, Preston, and Garrett nodded with a chorus of, Yes, sirs, and got to work tossing the vehicles into neutral and starting to push. Charlie moved to help Garrett, but Wrangle put a hand on his arm. Cohen, help Garrett out, he said firmly. The private looked like he wanted to protest, but thought better of it and got behind Garrett's vehicle. Once they were a good twenty yards away, the sergeant cocked his head at Charlie. Bite or blood type, huh? he drawled. Doesn't seem like your kind of game. What? the doctor asked sheepishly. I can't be morbid like you lot? Wrangle chuckled. I suppose, he admitted. But level with me. Is there anything I need to be aware of? Charlie contemplated for a moment and then finally shook his head. Nah, it's all under control, he said. Just Reed blowing off some steam and dealing with his... he hesitated, wincing. You know, his... death sentence? Wrangle suggested. Charlie shivered. Not sure that was the phrase I was looking for, but it fits, he admitted. Reed's a tough motherfucker and can handle a lot, Wrangle said. But if he starts getting more out of whack than he already is, you let me know. A little levity can be healthy, but if he starts making a necklace out of zombie ears... Charlie shivered again. Trust me, you'll be the first to know, he promised. The sergeant motioned for Charlie to follow him and they walked over to the edge of the bridge, watching the men on the far side of the gorge line up the two cars side by side. Hey, Sarge, the corporal's voice came through the communicator. We're going to race these puppies down to the bottom. You're the judge. Let us know who hits first. Wrangle shook his head. All right, Reed. Then get your asses back here. We still have a mission to accomplish, he said firmly. The corporal gave them a thumbs up from across the way before the soldiers got into position and began pushing the cars. They picked up speed, and then the vehicles veered right off of the cliff, careening to the bottom, where a horrific crashing sound echoed back up to them as they hit the other cars already down there. Wrangle hit his communicator. Congratulations, Corporal! You and Preston are the winners, he said dryly. In the distance, they could hear the soldiers let out celebratory whoops and watch them high-five each other. You four hang tight, Wrangle continued. Charlie and I will be right over. He let go of the communicator and waved for the doctor to follow him. Come on, let's go pick them up before they cause any more trouble. The two headed back to the SUV, jumping in and taking off. As they went, Charlie looked once more back towards the poor soul trapped in the blue sedan, just waiting to melt away into nothingness. He'd seen tens of thousands of zombies, but contemplating that fate hit him hard for some reason. He shook it off as they approached the other side of the bridge, and the men jumped inside. Thanks for judging, Sarge. Always good to get a victory, Reed quipped as he got in. Yeah, you better enjoy it while you can, Garrett quipped. I'm gonna get you good next time. Reed pointed to his shoulder. You'd better make it quick, bud, he drawled. Tick-tock, tick-tock. Wrangle's jaw tightened, but he didn't say anything. If the corporal was in good spirits, it was probably best for himself and for the group. All right, let's hit the road, he said. I swear, though, Preston said as he closed his door behind him, if there's another bridge like this, 
I'm going to find the road planner and shoot them in the head, zombie or not. They're a government bureaucrat in the apocalypse, Cohen said. Chances are somebody already beat you to the punch on that one. Preston laughed. Yeah, you're probably right, he admitted. Wrangle drove off-road, riding along the bumpy ground beside the highway. Cars still stretched bumper to bumper as far as they could see ahead. If it's like this all the way to the state park, how in the hell are we getting through that? Garrett asked, leaning forward. I doubt there's going to be much room on the sides of the road as it snakes through the mountain. A few moments later, the SUV passed a sign boasting, Mount St. Jacinto, State Park Entrance, four miles. Looks like you'll have your answer soon enough, Garrett, Wrangle said. The group lapsed back into relative silence as they continued to drive. After three more miles of bumpy off-roading, Wrangle hit the brakes again. What is it, Sorge? Garrett asked, leaning forward. Found the cause of the log jam, Wrangle replied, pointing ahead at a massive pileup. It looked like an eighteen-wheeler had jackknifed, falling over on its side and catching fire with several more vehicles ramming into it. A few cars looked like they tried to go around, but the sedans couldn't manage the off-road conditions and got stuck. There were some other tracks around them, but they weren't very deep. Wrangle continued driving, but again slammed on the brakes when they circled around the truck. Everybody murmured and breathed different versions of fuck at the same time at the sight of another bridge with half a dozen cars on it. This time some overturned and blocking the path. Hope everybody got rested up, Wrangle declared. We got another one of these to clear. There was a loud grumbling as the soldiers got out of the vehicle, walking up towards the carnage, which looked like an SUV had lost control and come off of the road, flipping it and causing a few other cars to smack into it. Wrangle walked off to the side looking past it at the relatively clear road, the entrance to the park nearly within sight. On the plus side, we have some clear sailing after this, he declared. Well, let's clear as a path so we can get to it, Reed added, and the soldiers got to work clearing what they hoped was the last bridge they'd have to work on that day. Chapter 2 Thirty Hours Remain with the bridge clear, they drove up towards the entrance of the park. There were no cars in front of them, just a two-lane road leading into a heavy tree-lined area. Even though the sun was nearing its apex for the day, it was still fairly dark on the road, the trees blocking a lot of the light. Just off to the right side of the road was a small sign reading, Welcome Center, half mile on the right. There was a good chance a lot of the people in those cars fled on foot, Wrangle reminded them so keep your eyes peeled for hostiles. He took it slow around the curvy roads, not wanting to damage the vehicle by slamming into another traffic jam. The drive to the Welcome Center turnoff was uneventful, with no movement outside and no cars on the road. When they turned into the driveway, however, there were several cars in the parking lot with some movement between them. Easily a dozen or so ghouls staggered around with a few more banging on the doors to get inside. Wrangle stopped the SUV before any of the zombies noticed them. I swear, nothing's easy today, he muttered. There's not too many of them. This will be a cakewalk, Reed quipped, and drew his machete. Come on, let's have a little fun. He jumped out of the vehicle, and the other soldiers looked at their sergeant with hesitancy. He's engaged in helping, Wrangle replied, maybe a little too quickly. We need a map of the area from inside there. If he gets too reckless, I'll call him on it. Good? The other soldiers nodded and filtered out of the vehicle, drawing their blades and jogging to catch up with their murderous corporal. Reed stepped up to the first zombie he came across, kicking it in the chest and sending it stumbling backwards, allowing him to swing his machete across to hit a standing ghoul in the head. He used the momentum to spin around and jam the blade into the fallen one's eye socket. The rest of the men quickly stepped up and joined the fray, stabbing and kicking the creatures away. Within a matter of moments, the parking lot zombies all lay still. Wrangle motioned for Garrett to follow him up the stairs towards the front door, where the three remaining zombies banged on the glass. The duo snuck up behind them, getting onto the raised platform a few yards away. They spread apart a bit before Wrangle darted forward, grabbing the zombie in the center by its shirt and throwing it back as hard as he could. It was enough force to send it tumbling backwards down the stairs, 
bouncing several times before coming to rest at the bottom, where Reed delivered a killing blow. The other two zombies remained focused on trying to get in through the door. This allowed Wrangle and Garrett safe time to strike with their blades into the base of the skulls, ending both simultaneously. As the corpses dropped, both soldiers slumped when they saw the view. Well, that explains why they were trying to get inside, Garrett muttered, shaking his head in defeat. A few dozen zombies pawed at the inside of the glass, gnashing their teeth, desperate to get out. As they stared, the rest of the soldiers walked up the stairs, one by one stopping short at the sight. That looks like a shit show, Cohen declared. Preston sighed. At this point, I'm convinced if you were around more than two other people when all this began, you didn't make it, he said. All it took was one person turning, and everybody in the building would be doomed in a matter of minutes, Cohen agreed. Preston shook his head and looked to his sergeant helplessly. How badly do we need to get in there? he asked. I know we're supposed to turn right at the second highway we come across, but I have no idea where that's going to take us out at, Wrangle replied. Plus, if there's another roadblock, it might be useful to know how the roads go so we can adjust on the fly. Unless you boys are keen on clearing another bridge. There was an immediate chorus in the negative, so emphatic that Wrangle held up a hand to quiet them down. That's what I thought, he said. So, any ideas? If you guys can keep them distracted on this side, I can sneak in behind them, grab what we need, and get out before they even know I'm there, Reed suggested. Wrangle immediately shook his head. Little too dangerous, Corporal, he said firmly. It's a sound plan, Sarge, Reed argued. It's a plan we'll consider if there are no other options, Wrangle shot back. Who's got another one? Garrett shrugged. Sending that one down the stairs seemed to do a quality job, he said. We can rig us a tripwire at the top of the stairs, spend two bullets to shatter the glass, then let them come tumbling down to us. I'm liking that, Wrangle said, nodding. Effective, and about the closest to safe we're going to get. Reed huffed, crossing his arms. Corporal, how about you be the trigger man? Wrangle asked, knowing he needed to placate his friend, or risk him getting too reckless. Stand up there, fire a few shots, then huff it down the stairs. Reed contemplated for a brief moment before nodding in agreement. Hell yeah, now we're talking, he said. We got us a plan, Wrangle said. Garrett, rig the tripwire. Let's do this. The private walked back down the stairs and headed to the back of the SUV as everyone got into formation. He popped open the back, lifting up the panel at the bottom and rooting around for a moment. There we go, he murmured, pulling out a giant set of jumper cables. He grinned as he sauntered back to the stairs, smacking Preston on the chest as he walked by. Gonna need a hand. The two of them got to the top of the stairs, stretching out the cables which was more than long enough to cover the opening. Garrett positioned it a foot off of the ground before tying it off, and Preston followed suit. Just to be sure, Garrett grabbed the middle and pulled hard, making sure there wasn't too much give. Looking good on that side? he asked. Preston double-checked his knot and gave a thumbs up. It isn't going anywhere, he said. Garrett nodded and motioned for his partner to follow. The two of them hurried down the stairs, taking up a position next to the others. We're good, Sarge, Garrett said. All right, Reed, you're up, Wrangle said with a wave. The corporal bounded up the stairs quickly, like a kid to an ice cream store, and the soldiers all shot concerned looks at Wrangle, but he brushed them off. Reed reached the doors, zombies pressed up against the glass, excited at the prospect of fresh meat. Reed paced back and forth in front of the glass, staring them up and down. Not sure what you're getting all excited for, he drawled and pointed to his shoulder. One of your asshole buddies already claimed me, and I'll be damned if anything else takes a bite out of me. He stared them down for another few moments, staring into roomy eyes as if he were trying to establish dominance. Finally, he drew his handgun, checking to make sure there were several rounds in the magazine before beginning his assault. He took a few steps back from the doors, giving himself plenty of room to turn and hop over the makeshift tripwire. He cocked the hammer back, aiming it straight at the forehead before shifting his aim quickly to the one standing beside it. He practiced the switch between the two a few times, getting the timing and movement down. Any day now, Corporal, 
Wrangle urged. Reed gave him a thumbs up, continuing his aim practice a few more times before taking a deep breath. He pulled the trigger, and his bullet ripped through the glass, shattering the cheaply made material, which was no doubt provided by the lowest bid contract. The zombie slumped forward, being pushed through the glass as Reed switched to the other one and fired, shattering the door and a skull. Come and get me, he bellowed, standing there for a moment to make sure the ghouls would pile out of the building. When they toppled out, he turned and hopped over the tripwire, but his landing on the stairs wasn't steady, and he careened out of control. Thankfully, Garrett and Preston leaned in to catch him, setting him back on his feet. You good? Garrett asked. Never better, Reed quipped with a nod of thanks, and drew his knife. Come on, let's stab us some zombies. The five soldiers stood a few yards away from the bottom of the stairs, listening to the shuffling and moaning from above. It only took a few moments for the first of them to come into view. The creatures grew very excited at the sight of fresh meat below, focusing intently on them and marching forward. The jumper cable trap did its job, catching their feet and sending them tumbling down the stairs. The first few ghouls cracked their heads hard on the steps, one of them remaining motionless after the stroke. The other one attempted to get up, but was shoved back into the stairs when another zombie landed on top of it. Within moments, there was a cascading wave of rotting flesh pouring down the stairs, the sound of bones cracking into cut with moans as zombies continued to fall. The first few creatures managed to slide down to the bottom of the stairs, allowing the men to get to work. Reed was the first one into the fray, stabbing wildly at a ghoul that landed towards the railing on the stairs. Another pair of zombies stumbled towards his back. Garrett darted forward, grabbing him by the shirt and pulling him back so he didn't get hit by the falling ghouls. As soon as the zombies hit the ground, both soldiers delivered killing blows. Reed glanced at the private and nodded in appreciation, understanding dawning in his eyes that seemed to say that he would dial his actions down a notch. More and more creatures continued to come out of the building, tripping and falling. Before long, the men weren't able to move forward and hit them on the ground, because too many were falling. Everybody, take a few steps back, Wrangle suggested. We'll get them when they get up. The soldiers complied, waiting patiently for the clumsy beasts to crawl to their feet. The first one finally did, and Wrangle showed them how it was done, stepping forward and delivering a kill shot, tossing the corpse to the ground and stepping back to wait on another victim. The whole process took about ten minutes, with the ones on the stairs who weren't killed by the fall finally making their way down. Preston and Garrett stepped up and dispatched the final two, shoving them back to the pile they'd made. Anybody see any of these things moving? Wrangle asked. There was a chorus in the negative, and he nodded. Okay, there are a few still on the stairs, so tread carefully, he said. Reed held up a hand. Let me check it out, he suggested. Corporal! Wrangle said firmly. I know, Sarge. I was a little out of control there, Reed admitted, staring at his commanding officer and friend. But I can handle this. No use in risking your life when you have me around. Wrangle stared at him for a moment, searching him, and he could see that Reed was in control, so he nodded and motioned for him to go ahead. The corporal approached the stairs, where half a dozen ghouls still lay. Rather than check them all, he leaned down and stabbed each one in the head, neutralizing any threat. He continued up the stairs, peeking over the threshold and into the building, holding up a hand to the others. Got two more inside the building, he called. Can't tell if they're hung up on something or what, but they're moving. He continued to watch, but they didn't come close to the door. Finally, Reed waved the others up, and the soldiers made their way up the hill of rotten flesh careful not to slip. When they reached the top, they all peered inside, spotting the two flailing zombies near a support beam on the far end of the room. Stay frosty, Wrangle said, and led the men inside the building, knife at the ready. The windows all around the outer wall provided them with plenty of light, so they could see the back door to their right leading to a back office. Garrett, Preston, make sure we're alone, Wrangle said, motioning to the door. The two soldiers ran off to investigate as the three remaining troops walked towards the mysterious duo of zombies. As they got closer, they could see what was causing their immobilization. 
There were thick ropes around their torsos, keeping them in place. Both of the zombies, which had once been thirty-something men, were covered from head to toe in bite marks. Several chunks of flesh were missing, but that didn't stop them from thrashing about. Well, these two had a bad go of it, Cohen quipped. What do you think happened? Wrangle sucked in his cheeks and looked over them, shaking his head. Nothing good, that's for sure, he said. Reed took a moment, staring at the bites covering the two men. It was clear on his face that he was comparing him to them, wondering if they were bitten and tied up to keep from hurting the others. He let out a sigh and stabbed one in the head. The second one he stabbed twice, then a third time, continuing to drive his blade in more and more violently, even after the ghoul stopped moving. Wrangle put a hand on Reed's shoulder. You good, Corporal? he asked firmly. Yes, sir, Reed huffed, taking a step back. Just getting a little exercise. Well, see if you can find us a map, Wrangle instructed, because we're going to need one. The corporal nodded. Yes, sir, he said, and turned on his heel to walk off and search. Wrangle and Cohen exchanged a concerned look, but neither said anything. Garrett and Preston emerged from the back room with armloads of prepackaged snacks and bottles of water. We come bearing gifts, Garrett bellowed as they started handing stuff out. Guess they didn't live long enough to make it through their snacks, Preston said dryly. You know who'd like these? Cohen asked, holding up a bag of chips. Charlie! Wrangle chuckled. Well, damn, guess we should go get him out of the car, he said sheepishly. Hopefully he's smart enough to crack a window for himself, Preston joked. Garrett shook his head, heading off towards the SUV with a handful of snacks. I got him, he called laughing and shaking his head as he walked away. Reed approached with a fistful of maps, handing them out. Good news, they had plenty, he declared, so everybody gets their own. Wrangle unfolded it, studying the road system through the state park. He traced his finger along the main road that led to the highway that would take them to the nuclear plant. There is our path, he said. However, he traced his finger back to the first turnoff, which was just up the road from Vale Vista and San Jacinto, two largish towns just outside the state park boundaries. This first highway in a section could be bad. I have no idea how big these towns are, but if they're big enough to be included on a map, then they're going to have enough people to create an army, Cohen finished. And pretty sure we aren't going to have a giant staircase to knock them down, Preston added. Reed cracked his knuckles. How do we deal with it? he asked. Wrangle shook his head. The only way we can, he replied. Drive that way and hope for the best. That's a fun plan, Preston drawled, sarcasm evident in his tone. Isn't it, though? Wrangle quipped and inclined his head towards the door. Come on, let's hit the road, clock still running. They headed for the door, but Reed lingered on the balcony for a moment, looking out over the tree-lined mountains. He took a long, deep breath, staring. Hey, Reed! Preston said gingerly. You good? Huh? The corporal startled, and then shook his head. Oh, yeah, just taking a moment to enjoy the beauty. Preston hesitated, and then turned back fully, joining him on the patio to look over the trees. You know, I've never been to California before, Reed finally said. Always wanted to, but just never made it. Preston cocked his head. What did you want to see? he asked. Big cities? Wine country? Reed chuckled. Always fancied myself as a professional beach bum, he admitted. Man, that's a lifestyle I can get behind, Preston drawled. Beach chair, bucket of beers beside you, lots of ladies in skimpy bikinis wandering through your field of vision, he nodded thoughtfully. Yeah, I can get behind that. Reed took a deep breath, nodding slowly. Maybe in the next life, huh? he joked. After the shit we're dealing with in this one, it damn well better be, Preston said, and gave the corporal's good shoulder a reassuring squeeze. Come on, let's get to the car before Sarge starts yelling at us. Reed nodded and offered his friend a grateful smile, and then the two of them headed down the stairs to restart their mission. Chapter 3 Twenty-eight hours remain 
The path through the mountains is excruciatingly slow, with the group having to stop every quarter mile to push another vehicle out of the way. Preston and Garrett approached another sedan that had been rear-ended, sending it across both lanes of traffic and blocking the road. The two approached from the side, seeing that none of the doors were open. As they got within five yards, they saw movement inside, causing them both to let out a sigh. They got closer, spotting a family of three inside, thrashing about and excited for potential prey. Just can't open the door on this one, Preston said. Garrett cocked his head. We can do a squeeze play, he suggested. Okay, but who is the doorman? Preston asked. I can handle it if you aren't up to the task, Garrett said, putting a hand to his heart. Preston snorted. Funny, I was going to say the same thing to you, he said. Seeing as how neither of us wants to be the bait, we can rock, paper, scissors for it, Garrett suggested. Preston nodded, making a fist. You're on, he said. They stood opposite each other, readying themselves for battle. On three, Garrett said, holding out his fist. One, two, three. Both men shot out their hands, Garrett holding his flat and Preston staying as a fist, the former playfully covering the latter with a wide grin. Paper beats rock, Garrett declared. Looks like I'm the doorman. Just remember that you're supposed to slam it in their faces, Preston reminded him. Not let them all out. Garrett waved him off. Don't worry, man. I got you, he said. They got into position with Garrett grasping the door handle while Preston stood off to the side. The closest ghoul, what had once been a middle-aged man, thrashed hard against the driver's side door. Garrett nodded to Preston, then pulled hard on the door handle, which opened it halfway. The zombie immediately fell out, reaching for Preston, but Garrett slammed the door into its ribcage. The ghoul was trapped, thrashing about but unable to even pull its head up, giving Preston a chance to jam his knife into the back of its head. Okay, ease up while I clear him, he said, and his partner nodded, pulling back on the door ever so slightly, while keeping enough pressure on it to prevent the teenage sun zombie from coming from the passenger seat from going through it. Preston quickly pulled the corpse away, then readied his knife and got back into position. The duo repeated the process two more times, trapping and stabbing the zombies in the car until the threat was neutralized. Once clear, Garrett reached inside and popped the car out of gear, and the men pushed it to get it moving. A moment later it rolled well, right off of the road down a small embankment, crashing into a tree several yards away. Both soldiers took a moment to catch their breaths as Cohen came walking back from around the bend up ahead. There was a big smile on his face. What the hell are you so happy about? Preston asked. Cohen waved a hand. Got clear sailing as far as the eye can see, he declared. If we were in the desert that would get me excited, Garrett said dryly. But we're in the mountains on curvy ass roads. Exactly how far can your eye see? Half mile or so? Cohen replied. It's almost straight uphill, so whatever is on the other side should be easy enough to clear out. Just a small push and let gravity take over. The others shrugged, in agreement that they didn't want to get too excited. They waved back to Wrangle, who drove the SUV up so they could all hop back in. We ready to push forward? the sergeant asked. The men all replied in the affirmative, and he punched the gas. They came around the bend, and the path was clear, prompting the soldiers to finally smile. They climbed the hill, cars pushed off to the side of the road and easy to navigate, with one free lane at all times. When they crested the hill and looked down, all the smiles quickly faded. Holy mother of God, Garrett breathed. The group looked down at the intersection below, and it was chaos. The road was clear towards it, with cars on the side of the road, but at the intersection there were several hundred zombies, even approaching a thousand, all clamoring at multiple cars, completely blocking the road. Zombies stretched out across the entirety of the street, easily twenty-five to thirty yards across the highway. There were dozens, if not hundreds, of them in the woods to their left, just off the road. Wrangle pulled out the map, his pen marks showing the territory they'd covered so far. He pointed to the intersection below, tracing his finger back along the side road to the towns that had concerned him. 
I hate it when I'm right, he murmured. How in the hell are we getting through this? Preston cried. They're even in the woods, so God only knows how far we'd have to hike out to get around them. Cohen nodded. And even if we could do that, what then? He asked helplessly. We could find us another car on the other side, Charlie suggested. Surely some of them still have fuel in them? Wrangle shook his head. It's no good, he said. There could easily be thousands of these things in the woods by now. A branch falls, pulling dozens at a time away from this mob, who makes more noise. This has been going on for weeks now, so we have to assume that area is infested. So, Reed asked with a shrug, we can handle it. Hit and run on them. That didn't work out so well back in Banning, Cohen said dryly. The corporal glared at him, and Cohen raised a hand to stop him before quickly continuing. When we were in the woods, he clarified, a few of those things came at us from nowhere. Tackled me, remember? Reed paused and then nodded. Yeah, you got a point, he said. And that was just a handful of them. If there's that many of them out there, we could get overwhelmed, Garrett said. Preston huffed. So what do we do? he asked helplessly. Charlie looked towards the side of the road where they were, eyeing the eight vehicles that had been pushed off to the side of the road. A few had rolled down the embankment, making them useless, but five were still usable. What about the cars? he asked, pointing. The soldiers all turned and looked at him curiously. What about them? Wrangle asked, cocking a brow. We have a clear road and a hill leading straight for them, Charlie pointed out. Why not use the cars to punch through them? Maybe we get lucky and take out enough of them or thin them out so we can get through. The soldiers exchanged glances before finally shrugging and nodding. At the very least, it should be cathartic, Garrett said. Let's get one up and see what happens, Wrangle suggested. The men got to work getting out and heading for a small sedan, checking to make sure nothing inside was moving. When they saw it was clear, they opened the door to pop it into neutral. Preston got into the driver's seat and they moved it to the centre of the road before putting it into park. I need something to tie the steering wheel down with, he said. Reed opened the back door and grabbed a duffel bag, rooting through it for a moment before finding a long-sleeved dress shirt and tossing it up to the front. Does this work? he asked. I'll make it work, Preston replied with a sharp nod. Keep that bag out, we may need it. Reed nodded and shut the door as Preston got to work on securing the steering wheel. After a few moments it was secure, and the car sat in the middle of the road in between the two lanes, the zombies a couple hundred yards downrange. Okay, we're good. Let's get her rolling, Preston declared. Garrett and Cohen helped him push on the vehicle, and it picked up speed on the steep hill. The tension on the shirt kicked in, keeping it relatively straight, and it didn't take long for it to be moving at an accelerated pace, approaching the mob. Come on, baby, take him down, Reed murmured, rubbing his palms together. The group watched with bated breath as the makeshift weapon approached its target. Upon impact, bodies flew through the air, and the sedan carved its way through the horde. The front passenger wheel of the car got some air, hitting a zombie just right and flipping onto its side. It slid, rolled over, and slammed into another vehicle on the side of the road. The group's hope quickly faded as the hole the car had punched quickly filled with ghouls, almost like nothing at all had happened. Well, that could have went better, Charlie said, shoulders slumping. Now what? Cohen asked. Reed thought for a moment before going over to the next car. He looked inside at the lone zombie behind the wheel and didn't hesitate, opening the door and jamming his knife into the creature's head. What are you doing, Corporal? Wrangle asked. I need something heavy, Reed replied. The soldiers looked confused for a moment, glancing at each other, but nobody moved. Heavy! Heavy! Reed snapped. You know, like a rock? The men glanced back at Wrangle, who shrugged and nodded, so they all started looking around. Meanwhile, Reed jerked the corpse from the car, tossing it to the ground and getting behind the wheel. He looked at the gas gauge, finding that there was a quarter tank left. Okay, come on now, start up for me, he prayed, and tried the key. The engine wheezed for several seconds before finally turning over. Woo! he cried, smacking the steering wheel in celebration. Now we're talking! He popped the car into drive, 
getting it back onto the road and centering it on the double yellow line. Once it was in position, he put it in park, looking back at Charlie, who was standing there with the duffel bag from the previous vehicle. Hey, bud, grab me a shirt, Reed called. Charlie nodded, digging through the bag and pulling out another long-sleeved shirt, handing it over. Reed hissed as he overextended his arm, aggravating his shoulder wound. He winced and shook it off, getting to work on securing the steering wheel. Preston approached, carrying a large rock with Wrangle in tow. Got your rock, the private declared. Mind telling me what you have in mind, Corporal? Wrangle asked, crossing his arms. Well, Sarge, Reed said as he stood up straight. That last car made a dent in them, but didn't have the velocity to pull all the way through the horde. I figure if we get it up to speed, it might have a better chance. Wrangle nodded. Might as well give it a shot, he said. Preston, give the man his rock. Preston heaved over the rock and Reed took it with his good arm. All right, you guys stand back, he said. They nodded and took a few steps back as Reed tossed the rock onto the gas pedal. The engine whined with strain and then went full throttle. He threw the car into drive and jerked himself free of the door as the sedan's tires spun. They caught just as he got clear and sped down the hill towards the horde. The soldiers watched with hesitant hope, but the car veered a little to the right, pulled off centre by the burnout. By the time it reached the mob, it was almost on the right shoulder, but trending straight. It hit the zombies with such force that several of the ghouls broke apart, limbs rotted away to the point of easy dismemberment. The car didn't stop, ploughing completely through the mob, further veering to the right from the impact of the ghouls on the front end. It cleared the zombies, going off a steep embankment to the side of the road. A loud crash echoed through the trees, but the impact was completely out of sight. Reed let out a celebratory cheer, smacking Wrangle on the arm. Fuck yeah! he cried. A couple dozen zombies peeled off from the group to pursue the noise from the car. Preston's brow furrowed. Why are so few of them going after the car? he asked. Something in those cars must really have their attention, Charlie said. Who cares? Reed quipped. We figured out a way to get through them. Wrangle shook his head. Too big of a risk to try and punch through with the SUV, he said. You saw what happened to the one we had earlier. One wrong hit and we lose a tire or an axle. We get stuck in that mess and we're done. Then we use one of these cars to lead the way, the corporal argued. Let it be the battering ram and we get through without a scratch. The other soldiers looked around, having a silent conversation with each other, debating the idea. They all eventually nodded in agreement. Yeah, that could work, Garrett finally said. But how are we going to keep that thing straight? Doesn't do as much good to punch through if we just end up in the ravine. I'll drive it, Reed said. The silence was deafening as all eyes glared at the corporal. He immediately shook his head. Don't you dare give me that look, he snapped. We all know my clock's sitting at two minutes to midnight and nothing is going to change that. And don't think I'm volunteering for a suicide mission either. Because if I get hung up in that horde, you motherfuckers better push me out of it. The soldiers muttered and grumbled and let out nervous laughs. Sarge, what do you think? Garrett asked helplessly. Wrangle looked down at the mob which had already filled in from where the car had punched through just a few moments ago. He looked over to the woods just off of the cross street, seeing a ton of movement, and then down at his watch. He sighed. I think this is our only realistic chance, he admitted. Let's get it set up. The men nodded leaping into action, debating on which vehicle would be the best choice. Wrangle took another look at the mob below. They were going to need all the luck on their side. Chapter 4 Twenty-seven and a half hours remain. Reed sat in his vehicle, a luxury sedan that was a bit larger than necessary for everyday living. However, it was perfect for their current predicament. Wrangle, meanwhile, was in the massive SUV with the rest of the group, all buckled in for safety. He rolled down the window and stuck his head out. We're good here, he called. When you're ready, Corporal. Reed stuck a thumbs up out the window from the driver's seat. He sat there for a few moments, staring at the horde of flesh-eating ghouls that were just a few hundred yards away. He checked his belt making sure it was secure. 
The last thing he wanted was to hit one just right, causing the car to stop and send him flying through the windshield, only to get eaten alive. Finally, he was ready to go. He stuck his arm out the window, waving the others forward to show that they were going to be rolling. He pulled his arm back in and closed the window, revving the engine a few times to make sure that the long dormant vehicle was up to the task. Finally, Reed dropped the car into drive and floored it. The luxury sedan, despite its size, had significant pickup, and the tires spun for a second before finally catching and propelling him down the road. He glanced in the rearview mirror, seeing that Wrangell was keeping pace with him, getting within a couple yards of his back bumper. He gripped the steering wheel tightly, bracing for the impact that was mere seconds away. The zombies at the intersection barely noticed him coming their way, with only a handful of them looking in his direction, the rest still focused on the cars that so raptly held their attention. The front end of the sedan struck the first zombie, sending it flying back into several others. A fraction of a second later several more were struck, causing the corporal to lurch forward from the sudden deceleration. Wrangle was quick enough to tap the brake so he didn't slam into the back bumper, which Reed appreciated. The bite on his shoulder was enough to deal with. Whiplash was unnecessary. The plan was working, with the zombies mowing down the vehicle, but halfway through the crowd he hit some very large ghouls, one of which stuck to the front of the vehicle. This slowed him down way too much, and Wrangle wasn't quick enough with his brakes this time, slamming into the back bumper. While this did allow the vehicle to push forward to the back end of the mob and shake loose the overweight zombie on the hood, it also caused Reed to lose control. As soon as he was clear of the horde, the car sharply swerved to the left. He tried to compensate by turning the wheel hard, but he overcorrected, spinning violently the other way. The wheels caught and he careened out of control towards the drop on the side of the road. Fuck! he screamed, bracing himself as he went off the side, the car flipping as it rolled down the hill. Wrangle slammed on the brakes watching the sedan helplessly. Garrett unbuckled himself and dove out the door with his handgun and knife. Private, what are you doing? Wrangle barked. Not leaving him behind, sir, Garrett said firmly. The sergeant looked back at the mob, where easily a hundred zombies lumbered towards them from about twenty yards away. He quickly grabbed the map, looking at where they were, and finding a spot. There's a rest area a mile and a half up the road, Wrangle said. Be there in ninety minutes. We'll be there, Garrett promised, and slammed the door shut, banging hard on the door as a send-off. As Wrangle sped away, Garrett looked back towards the ghouls heading in his direction and closing fast. He holstered his weapons and took off running towards the slope on the side of the road, sprinting as hard as he could. Under normal circumstances, he would have retreated to buy himself a little more space, but with the violent nature of the crash Reed was just in, and the presence of an untold number of zombies below, he didn't have a second to spare. He pumped his legs, keeping the marching horde in his periphery, each step they took pushing him to go harder and faster. As he reached the edge of the road, just a few yards away from the start of the slope, several zombies were within arm's reach of him. Rather than fight them, Garrett slid into a baseball slide. He had enough speed and mass to get some distance on the forest floor, ducking underneath the decrepit arms and beginning his descent to the low-lying area below. The slope was steeper than he'd anticipated, almost a sixty-degree angle, so his slide was extended for several terrifying seconds. He kicked his legs on the ground just enough to push him out of the path of some trees rapidly approaching him. One of the kicks, however, caused him to tumble, so he spent the last few yards of his journey rolling over and over. Finally, he landed with a thud on the ground, a little bruised and a little dizzy. He shook his head to snap out of it, adrenaline and outright terror coursing through his veins. Garrett glanced back up to the top where the road and the zombies were. The sight was not a welcome one. A couple dozen zombies decided to continue their pursuit, only to fall less than gracefully down the steep hill. A couple of them smacked into the very first tree, sending them careening wildly into the path of others. Garrett forced himself to break away from the spectacle, 
turning towards the wreck. The first car they'd sent down the hill that had gone off course was in the distance, with no zombies around it. Or at least, not directly around it. There were several dozen in the general area, all of which were intently focused on the large vehicle Reed was in, the vehicle that was currently on its hood. The wreck site was a hundred yards or so from the private, but the front edge of the zombies were within ten yards and closing. Garrett immediately started to sprint, pulling out his handgun and firing several shots wildly in their direction, hoping to draw attention to himself and away from Reed. Yeah, over here, assholes, he bellowed. Only a couple of ghouls took the bait, most of them continuing to move in on the vehicle. Garrett kept his handgun in his hand as he continued to run, all the while staring at the car, hoping to see movement from the driver's side door, but it was too far away. You better be alive, Reed, Garrett muttered under his breath, and continued his sprint, making it to within thirty yards just as the first zombie reached the car. The driver's side window was smashed right out, and a creature knelt down to reach inside, more wide open and snarling hunger. Garrett skidded to a stop, took quick aim, and fired, hitting the zombie in the side of the head. He took off like a shot, the next zombie only two yards away, mere seconds from making it to the vehicle. Garrett managed to close the gap quickly, and the zombie staggered, wobbly on its feet, losing its balance as it got close. When Garrett came within five yards of the driver's side door, he fired one more shot as he slowed down, hitting the corpse in the forehead and sending it flying back. He took up an offensive position, opening fire on the dozens of ghouls closing in on him. The ghouls were spread out over a twenty-yard area, all shambling in his direction. He emptied the magazine, hitting several in the head and dropping them, buying him at least twenty seconds. Garrett dropped to one knee, looking inside where he spotted a dazed reed, bleeding from the forehead from a cut, thankfully, instead of a bite. Come on, Corporal, we gotta move, Garrett barked. Reed turned his head in a daze, as if he couldn't quite focus on the private. Garrett? He slurred. What the hell? Why are you? I'm here to save your ass, Garrett cut in, and you're making it difficult. He paused, quickly slapping in another magazine and shooting several more times before smacking the door. Cut yourself out of that belt, man. We got a whole lot of company. Reed tried his best to snap out of his daze, moving slower than normal, but managed to pull his knife and saw at his seatbelt, which was locked in place. As he worked on it, Garrett fired more shots, buying them precious seconds. Finally, he made it through the belt and dropped from the seat, curling his head so that his shoulders took the brunt of his weight, landing on blood-soaked glass and debris. Garrett heard the thump and reached in through the shattered window, grabbing Reed by the shirt and yanking him out. Once he was clear, the private continued firing, and Reed pulled himself up, looking around them in terror. Despite his best efforts, Garrett had only managed to take out a small fraction of the zombie threat, and in reality had drawn a lot more attention towards them than he'd wanted to. Reed looked in the direction they needed to be moving, and fear shot down his spine. The couple dozen zombies coming down the incline next to the road had grown to nearly a hundred, and they fanned out across the forest floor. The corporal turned to his saviour, grabbing his shoulder as he fired another round, pulling him towards the new threat. We should move, he said firmly. Garrett whirled, and as soon as he saw the problem, gave his companion a nod. They took off in that direction, and Reed took a step, crying out and stumbling. Unable to keep his balance, he let out a pained yelp as he fell. No time for lounging around, Reed, Garrett barked. Fuck, my ankle, the corporal hissed, a look of pure agony on his face. Garrett assessed his leg, a significant amount of blood rising up Reed's pant leg. He assumed it was broken, but the only thing holding it in place was the boot on his foot, but they didn't have time to deal with it. He grabbed Reed's arm, yanking him up and throwing it over his shoulder for stability. Just leave me, the corporal huffed. That's an order. With all due respect, fuck your orders, corporal, Garrett snapped. I've come this far, and I'm not leaving your ass out here to die. Reed gritted his teeth and drew his handgun, as the two of them did a modified three-legged race through the woods. 
Instead of the potential of winning a blue ribbon, they'd hopefully win by not being eaten alive. They hustled through the underbrush, trying their best to move deeper into the woods to avoid the coming mob, but their options were limited. The area they'd come into was somewhat open, but within fifteen to twenty yards, the brush got a lot thicker, making it much more difficult to pass through. They paused in between the converging hordes, with about a minute before they were within the grasps of reaching rotted hands. If we can get around their flank, we shall be able to outrun them, Garrett suggested. Reed shook his head. I hope in my next life I get your optimism, he muttered. Garrett didn't respond, instead focusing intently on a path to get them through. To their right was a gap of about ten yards from the edge of the zombies, which stretched thirty yards or so back to the slope. They ran about fifty yards long with corpses, so a sprint wasn't going to cut it. How's your ammo? Garrett asked. Reed checked his reserves. I've got this mag and one more, he said. Give me your extra mag. I got an idea, Garrett said, holding up his free hand. Reed shook his head as he handed it over, knowing that whatever idea his companion had, it couldn't be good. Do I want to know? he asked dryly. We're going to get through that gap, Garrett said. No way in hell we're getting to the other side, Reed shot back. The private nodded. We will, once I pull them back over towards the road. Reed's eyes widened and he shook his head vehemently. We don't have time to negotiate, Garrett snapped, cutting off whatever disapproval he was about to express. This is what's going to happen, so you better get on board real quick, Corporal. Reed grunted, but nodded. Okay, what do you want me to do? he asked. I need you to stay as quiet and as still as you can, Garrett said. Then when I give the signal, you man the fuck up and start hobbling through the gap I'm about to open. I'll catch up and help you along, but you need to cover some ground. You good with that? Reed nodded firmly. I'm game, he said. Good, because here we go, Garrett quipped, and then took off, running to the other side of the forest, opening about twenty-five yards away. Reed took a knee, remaining quiet and motionless as the private began to bellow. Yeah! Over here! Garrett yelled. Come and get me! Fresh meat ready to be served up! He fired off a few shots towards the mob, hitting a couple in the chest, one finding a brain. The outcome of the shots didn't matter, only the noise it was making. The one successful one was a bonus. It didn't take long for the distraction to pay dividends as the throng of creatures shifted in his direction. Garrett continued to fire, pulling as many of them towards him as possible. All the while, he looked over his shoulder at the zombies behind him that were gaining ground. After several moments and half a magazine of bullets, Garrett glanced at Reed, who nodded that he was making a move. He got up, grimacing in pain as he hobbled forward. He managed not to make any noise and undo the work Garrett was doing, moving as quickly as he could. He was still slow, hugging the far edge of the open area with the closest zombie about fifteen yards from him. Thankfully, the ghouls had their heads turned towards Garrett, who was still causing a scene. Reed glanced back when he was about twenty yards away from being clear of the mob, panic rising at not being able to see Garrett. There was no sign of him. The corporal kept shuffling forward as quietly as he could, and then finally after several tense moments, Garrett sprinted around the edge of the mob, causing the zombies to adjust their course. It was a cascade of head-turning as the private ran right down the line, rushing to catch up. Reed pushed himself into second gear, hobbling as fast as he could. His teeth gritted so hard they were nearly squeaking at the intense pain in his likely broken ankle. The zombies that had been ignoring him were now interested, and that helped light a fire under him. About ten yards from the end of the mob, Garrett caught up to him and didn't break pace ducking down and coming up underneath Reed's arm. He had enough strength and momentum to carry the two of them clear of the mob, not stopping until they were about ten yards clear of the walking corpses. He set Reed down, allowing him to readjust, wrapping his arm around his shoulder. You good to move? he asked. Reed nodded. Let's do it, he said, though his voice was strained and laced with pain. Couple hundred yards ought to do it, Garrett huffed. We're going to be hustling. They shuffle off, 
moving at a much more rapid pace than was comfortable for the corporal. But Garrett held him up enough so that the bad ankle didn't give them much trouble. The duo raced away from the mob, putting a couple hundred yards of distance between them. The trees began to thicken a little, giving them some cover. Finally, Garrett and Reed stopped, both of them sucking wind. They're still going to be coming for us, but I'm hoping the trees will cause them some issues, Garrett said through sharp breaths. At the very least, we should be able to slow down a bit, Reed huffed, his attempt to sound light and casual marred by the pain and exhaustion clear in his voice. Garrett looked around on the ground, spotting a short but sturdy tree branch. He snatched it up and put his weight on it to test it out before holding it out to Reed. Not exactly medical grade, but should relieve the pressure on your ankle, he suggested. Reed took it and put his own weight on it, finding the height and shape decent enough to use as a crutch. Thanks, he said, nodding. So, where are we headed? Got a rest area about a mile and a half up the road, Garrett said, inclining his head. Sarge and the others are going to meet us there. Reed forced a smile. Nothing like an afternoon hike, huh? He drawled. The private chuckled, shaking his head. Only thing missing is a picnic basket and some ladies, he said. As always next time, Reed sighed as he began to walk, the companion sharing a dark laugh, given the circumstances, before they continued to rendezvous with the others. Chapter Five Half an hour had passed as the duo hobbled their way through the woods towards the others. Garrett helped Reed get along, but with each step the pain grew more and more intense. Stop! Stop! Reed finally huffed, practically shoving his companion along. I need a minute, man! Garrett shook his head. We really need to keep pushing, he insisted. We're making good time, the corporal argued. Five minutes isn't going to make much of a difference to the mission, but it will make a world of difference to me. Garrett pursed his lips. I'm going to remember you said that when we finally get to the control panel, he quipped, but complied, gently setting his charge down on a fallen tree. Reed let out a massive sigh of relief as Garrett looked around, making sure they were alone. He stared intently from the direction they'd come from. I wouldn't worry about it. Reed said when he noticed his friend looking back. We left those things in the dust. Even if they managed to not get tripped up or distracted by something, it will still take them an hour or so to catch up. Garrett grunted. That may be, but I'd just like to be sure, he said firmly. Don't need no surprise visitors. Yeah, tell me about it, Reed quipped, pointing to his shoulder. Those surprise visitors are a bitch. Garrett swallowed hard his eyes widening when he realized what he'd said. He opened his mouth to apologize, but Reed held up a hand to stop him. Relax. I know you didn't mean it that way, the corporal said with a chuckle. And if I'm being honest, I was the surprise visitor in that situation. Dropped down right on top of those fuckers. Still, Garrett said hoarsely. Sorry. Nothing to be sorry about, Reed said with a sigh. The reality of this whole thing is that it's a suicide mission. I mean, did you honestly think any of us would be walking away from this in one piece? Garrett opened his mouth and then closed it again, really contemplating the question. The bluntness of his friend's tone hit him hard. Sure, they joked about it being a suicide mission, but something in his voice felt different. For the first time, it was really sinking in that it might not be a joke anymore. On the first day this stuff hit, if someone had told me I'd be alive damn near six weeks later, I would have laughed at them, Garrett finally admitted. All those things sprinting around, looking at somebody who sneezes or coughs and seriously contemplating putting a bullet in their heads just to be on the safe side? Hell, I didn't think I was going to last the first day. Reed cocked a brow. Big tough guy like you? he asked. Never a doubt in my mind you'd be just fine. Plus, you had all of us backing you up. Garrett shook his head. Yeah, I had you guys once I got back to base, he said. My day didn't start out like that, remember? Reed's face fell, brow furrowing in confusion. Wait, you didn't know I wasn't on base with you? Garrett asked. The corporal shook his head. I had no idea, he replied. 
Just remember getting jolted out of bed by Sarge and having him yelling at me to get my ass moving. First thing I did was help them contain a group of... He paused, looking uncomfortable as he searched for the right words. Unfortunate souls with the wrong blood type. There were a few hundred of them all packed into the mess hall. Some of those guys looked like they were knocking on death's door, and some looked like they were in better condition than I was. It was crazy, like I couldn't understand why they were all in the same place, being treated like they had the plague. He gritted his teeth, the unwanted memory clearly washing over him like a tidal wave. I remember I broke up a couple of fights and helped keep a lid on things until they could scrounge up enough MPs to hold down the fort. By the time I caught up with the squad, you were there. He paused. But you know, now that I think about it, I do remember you having a particular unsettled look in your eyes. Guess I just wrote it off because of what was happening. Garrett took a deep breath. Yeah, I got there about five minutes before you did, he said. So what happened? Reed asked. Nothing good, man, Garrett replied, waving him off. Nothing good. Oh, hell no, the corporal said, pointing a stiff finger at him. You aren't going to do a setup like that and back out. Tell me what happened. Garrett hesitated, eyes downcast. It's not like anybody will ever know, Reed urged. I will take it to my grave, which is any minute now. The private let out an uncomfortable horror laugh before scrubbing his hands down his face. All right, all right, he finally said. Can't refuse the wish of a dying man after all. Damn straight, Reed quipped. I was off base that morning, early, before the crack of dawn, Garrett began. Hell, before anybody outside of the tip-top of the command structure knew what was happening. I did my thing, got done a little early, in fact, so I took advantage of it. Stopped at this little donut shop that had kick-ass galaches. Figured I could shove down a couple of those on the drive back and nobody would be none the wiser. For the record, we always knew when you did that, Reed interjected and were secretly irritated that you didn't bring any back for us. You know what I was getting paid, Garrett said with a roll of his eyes. I was lucky I could feed myself. Reed chuckled. Yeah, fair enough, he said. Go on. Garrett took a deep breath. I remember walking in just as the sun was starting to come up, the light hitting that display case perfectly, the donut glaze glistening. Just an idyllic scene, he said his eyes glazing over with the difficult memory, until the doorbell went off as I walked across the threshold. It was like I set off a dinner bell at the homeless shelter. I heard three, maybe four sets of footsteps running from the back. I can still hear the moans and shrieks echoing in my head as they rushed towards me. I barely had time to react to what was happening before they emerged from the kitchen area. The older couple that ran the place, and a couple of customers, I guess. All of them were messed up, blood covering the front of them, almost gurgling blood as they screeched at me. Reed gaped at him. How the hell did you get out of that? He demanded. Only thing that saved me was the front counter, Garrett admitted. Those things were fast, but thank the Lord Almighty above they were dumber than a sack of doorknobs. All four of them ran smack dab into it, slowing them down just long enough for me to rush out the door and slam it shut. He let out a deep breath shaking his head as if he were reliving the moment. So what happened next? Reed prompted, raising a hand. I ran back to my vehicle, but heard a scream coming from a few cars down, Garrett said hesitantly, staring down at his hands. This poor girl, couldn't have been more than twenty, was getting attacked by one of those things. Me being the dumbass that I am, I went to help her. This big dude was on her, like my size, if I went to the buffet three times a day for the next six months. He had a death grip on a wrist and was pulling it towards his mouth. He sighed, words coming out quicker now. She was struggling to keep him at bay, but she just didn't have the strength. Just as I got there, he took a chunk of her arm. She's screaming, blood's going everywhere, and I cracked that son of a bitch in the side of the head with my elbow. Wasn't enough to take him out by any means, but it knocked his breakfast right out of his mouth and put his ass on the ground. Broke his grip, too. Tried to turn my attention to the girl, but she was hysterical. Not that I blame her, mind you, but I just couldn't get her to focus. The only thing that stopped her from screaming was an overwhelming sense of fear at what she was seeing. Reed shook his head. That must have put you at ease, he joked. 
given that's how women look at you when you approach them at bars. Garrett let out a laugh, breaking the tension and horror for a moment, and he was grateful to his friend for doing so for him. So what did she see? Reed asked. Half a dozen of those things running at us, Garrett replied. I turned just as the first one was getting to me. I don't know how I did it, but I managed to sidestep it, shoving it into the girl's car. It was running so fast that it cracked the driver's side window, which, of course, didn't phase it. I tried to grab her by the arm and pull her to safety, but she was in shock. Yanked her arm away before I could even make contact with it. He swallowed hard. I didn't have time to try again as those other things were bearing down on me. I had to save myself. So I turned and ran as hard as I could back to my ride. Started it up, threw it into drive, and took off. He paused as if he didn't want to say the next bit, but spit it out anyway. I don't know why, but I looked over towards her as I drove past, just for a second. She was swarmed by those things, thrashing about in an unimaginable amount of pain. I still feel guilty that I didn't do more to save her. Reed opened his mouth to argue, but Garrett held up his palms, shaking his head. I know, I know that it wouldn't have done any good, the private said. But I still feel guilty that I didn't pull her out of that mess. She didn't deserve to die like that. Reed's gaze darkened. Trust me when I say this, he said. You did her a favor by not saving her. I know you're trying to cheer me up, Reed, but that's bullshit, Garrett said. The corporal stared at him levelly, his tone a rare and deadly serious. No, it's the guard's honest truth, he said. That girl had a few intense moments of terror and then it was all over. If you had saved her from that mob, you would have just condemned her to a terrible fate. It's one thing to die, and it's another thing to know you're going to die without a damn thing you can do about it. He pointed to his shoulder, bloody bandages covering his own death sentence. Hasn't even been, what, half a day? And the thoughts of my impending demise are driving me crazy. I can handle some moments better than others, but there are times when you drive a car straight off a cliff Garrett cut in. Reed chuckled, shaking his head. Yeah, when I drive my car straight off a cliff, he admitted. He winced as he adjusted his posture and accidentally put pressure on his injured ankle. Well, the silver line in there is that maybe the ankle will calm your suicidal ass down a bit, Garrett quipped. I wouldn't bet on it, Reed said brightly. The private laughed along with him, shaking his head at the defiant tone and checked his watch. We should get a move on he said. Sarge isn't going to wait on us forever. Reed struggled to get up, and Garrett hooked an arm around his back. You good? Garrett asked. Reed sighed. Don't suppose a piggyback ride is available? He joked. Garrett glanced in the direction they were headed, with the uneven terrain and very unfriendly to someone with an injured ankle. Yeah, hop on, he finally said. But if you start feeling nibbly, you let me know so I can drop your ass on the ground. Reed chuckled and nodded as his friend turned around. It took a moment to get situated, but finally Garrett got him in a secure hold. You ready? he asked. Giddy up, Reed declared, whirling a hand over his head like a cowboy. Garrett turned his head enough to give his charge the side eye. Yeah, that was a bridge too far there, Reed admitted sheepishly, lowering his arm. My bad. Good, at least we're on the same page with that one, Garrett said and faced forward, hiking his way towards Wrangle and the others. Chapter 6 26 Hours Remain Garrett and Reed hike through the woods, seeing a clearing up ahead. Reed was still on Garrett's back, sucking wind from the hike with the extra weight, but still pushing forward. Pretty sure this counts as your cardio for the week, Reed quipped. Well, if you're right about this being a suicide mission, then this is all the cardio I'm ever going to need, Garrett shot back. They shared a morbid laugh as they approached the opening in the trees. As they emerged, a mid-sized building came into view in the center. A dozen or so corpses littered the ground, most within a few yards of the SUV parked near the entrance. They looked around the area for movement, but saw nothing. A moment later, a whistle came out of the front door and Wrangle strolled out, waving them in. 
Good to see they didn't leave us behind, Garrett said, coming out of the woods into full view. The sergeant took stock of the two men and hollered for Cohen and Preston to go help them. They ran over, hauling Reed down and allowing Garrett to stretch his back out. He exaggerated the motion with a loud groan. Oh, come on now. I'm not that heavy, Reed said. Garrett smirked. The hell you won't, he joked. The men headed back to the rest stop, where a small picnic table sat in the middle of the building covered in snacks, as well as a deck of cards dealt out like they'd been in the middle of a game. Looks like we missed a laid-back day, Sarge, Garrett joked. Wrangle shrugged as he took a seat. Well, we got our work done and decided to take it easy for a bit, he said. Come on, and have a seat. I'll go over what we figured out. Garrett sat, and Preston and Cohen took the corporal over to a large table setting him up there and going to work on his ankle. He let out a sharp hiss as they took off his boot. You good? Wrangle asked, brow furrowed. Reed gave him a thumbs up, his lips pressed into a thin, pained line. Garrett ripped into some snacks, downing half a bottle of water in a single gulp. You have much trouble getting here? Wrangle asked. Garrett shook his head. Pretty big crowd at the crash site, but easy going after that, he said. You did a good thing, the sergeant said firmly. Glad you were able to bring him back alive. Just did what I thought was right, Garrett said, and took another long swig of water. So, what did you find out? Wrangle pulled out a map, laying it down on the table. There was a big circle around where they were, and a couple of paths drawn throughout the mountain roads, all of which led to a spot just to the east of the nuclear plant. We had some time to kill while we were waiting on the two of you, so we started looking at the attraction pamphlets laying around, he said. Charlie found one that was of particular interest. He tossed down a scenic overlook pamphlet in front of Garrett, and the private set his empty water bottle down to inspect it. In big, bold letters, it read, Elevated Overlook of Pacific Ocean, just off I-5. There was a beautiful picture of the beach and the ocean from the position, Looks like a beautiful spot, Garrett said slowly, but not sure how that helps us. We thought that at first too, then we saw where it was on the map, Wrangle said, and pointed to the spot that was circled. The overlook was just to the east of the plant. Oh, I gotcha, Garrett said, nodding as he put the pieces together in his head. You weren't just looking for another picnic spot. No, Private, Wrangle said with a laugh. We were working while you were on your rescue mission. Garrett smirked as he reached for some of the cards on the table. Hey now, don't touch my hand, Charlie called from across the room. Both Preston and Cohen said, I fold, in unison in response to his excitement, and the doctor cursed. Damn it, I was down two snack packs, he muttered. Hard work indeed, Sarge, Garrett said. Wrangle headed over to Reed staring down at his bloody and out-of-whack ankle. Is it broken? he asked. Looks to be a dislocation, Preston replied. Honestly, I'm surprised he was able to walk on it at all. Reed raised his chin. I'm a tough son of a bitch, that's how, he declared. I'm sure you are, Preston replied. Keep that energy for a moment, Corporal. He grabbed Reed's ankle without any preamble and violently shoved it back into the socket. There was an audible snap, quickly followed by a pained groan. Preston patted Reed on the upper leg. You're good, bud. You're good, he said, and glanced at Cohen. Go see if you can find me some medical tape. There's got to be a first aid kit around here somewhere. They shared a nod, and he turned back to Reed. I'm going to get you taped up, and you'll be good to go. It's going to hurt like hell, but you should be able to put some pressure on it without it collapsing. Reed nodded focusing on his breathing as Wrangle pulled Preston out of earshot. Is he really good to go? The sergeant asked quietly. Or are you just blowing smoke? You heard him. He's a tough son of a bitch, Preston replied with a sad smile. We'll get him some painkillers and he'll be fine. Wrangle nodded and clapped him on the shoulder. You let me know when he's all patched up and ready to go. He headed back over to Garrett, who was studying the map. There were two main lines going through the mountain state park, and he kept moving his finger from one to the other. Looks like you're having the same dilemma that we were, Wrangle said. Garrett sighed. Do we go around Palomar Mountain, or through it? he asked. I guess with Reed's injury, kind of answers it for us, Wrangle said. 
Based on what we've encountered so far, it's safe to assume we'd hit resistance on the back roads. Quite possibly more than we would hit going through civilization, Garrett agreed. Wrangle sighed. On the plus side, it looks like the main road is a mile or two south of the only town, he said. Still a potential for trouble, but now that we have a plan to push through a mob, I think we'll be all right. Yeah, I get the sense that Reed would gladly volunteer to go demolition derby on another batch of them if we needed him to, Garrett said, staring off at the busted-up corporal. Wrangle cocked a brow. You two had a good chat on your hike, I take it? he asked. Yeah, we did, Garrett replied. The sergeant leaned forward on his arms. How do you think he's doing? he asked quietly. Garrett shrugged. As good as can be expected, he replied. He knows he's going to die soon, and is strangely okay with it. Guess that's better than him freaking out about it, Wrangle replied, shaking his head. Do we need to keep an eye on him? Garrett contemplated for a moment, choosing his words carefully. I think he'll be fine, he finally said. But if there's an opportunity for him to go out like a hero, we should let him do it. Wrangle nodded in understanding, and the two of them gazed back at Reed as he kept a stern face to hide his pain while the others put his boot back on. Wrangle picked up a bottle of water and some snacks off of the table, walking them over to Reed before turning around to face his men. All right, team. Listen up, he said. We're going to push through around Palomar Mountain. It's a little risky, but it will give us the most audible opportunities should we face a significant zombie defense. He looked around as they all nodded. Make sure you take advantage of all this facility has to offer, he motioned towards the restrooms. We move in fifteen. There was a chorus in the affirmative and the furious crinkling of snack bags as everyone loaded up on food, making their final preparations. Chapter 7 Twenty-five hours remain. Wrangle drove the group slowly up the road, seeing a sign for the small community of Temecula. There were a few zombies on the road, but they were spread out fairly well. This allowed Wrangle to weave in and out through the traffic. Soon, though, he had to stop rather abruptly. Everybody looked forward on the road, seeing a massive pileup blocking every lane. Wrangle looked to the side of the road, where there were concrete barriers. Well, this is a no-go, he muttered, and popped the SUV into reverse to backtrack. He tried his best to avoid a zombie, but they rolled over it. Whoops, my bad, he quipped, and the men chuckled. The sergeant did a three-point turn and then headed a mile or so back before they found an exit leading to a neighborhood. Wrangle paused at the exit, looking down the road at a smattering of ghouls in the distance. What do you think? he asked. Try it? At least in the neighborhood we'll have yards we can drive through if we need to, Preston pointed out. Sold, Wrangle said, and drove up the ramp around a bend and into a giant suburban nightmare. There were cookie-cutter houses as far as the eye could see, and also zombies as far as the eye could see, covering a significant portion of the roads. They weren't so dense that they couldn't drive through, thankfully. Wrangle drove all of four blocks before making the turn so they were parallel with the highway they were on before, all the while weaving in and out between zombies, occasionally knocking into one. I can't imagine living in a place like this, Cohen said as they drove, taking in the scenery. Every house looks the same. I'd need GPS just to find my home at the end of the day. Preston shook his head. Given how many zombies are wandering around this neighborhood, it looks like they're having the same problem, he said. Charlie stared out the window to the north, looking through the houses and side streets. His eye focused on an area a couple of blocks up that wasn't green and developed like the rest of the area. Sergeant, he said as he stared at the barren dirt. Wrangle glanced at him in the rearview mirror. Yeah, Charlie? he asked. Do me a favor and make a right turn at the next street, the doctor said as he motioned towards the non-green space. Any particular reason? Wrangle asked. Please, just to humor me, if it's not too much trouble, Charlie said, pressing his palms together. The sergeant glanced over at Reed in the shotgun seat, who shrugged and nodded. Just to play along, Wrangle hit the turn signal as they approached the intersection drawing laughs from the men. He made the turn, and they continued to weave in and out through the zombies, the congregation never even approaching a dangerous level. 
He drove up a couple of blocks as Charlie pushed his way forward so he could see better out the windshield. Okay, you can stop, Charlie said. Wrangle complied, checking the mirrors for potential threats, but there were only a handful of creatures, so they had some time. Charlie grinned widely. What's got you looking so happy? Wrangle asked, looking around. Charlie pointed out over the barren dirt area, which also had a few piles of construction goods. A giant dump truck filled with dirt stood a couple hundred yards away. Just coming up with a contingency plan, he said, motioning to the dump truck. We don't know how bad the situation at the nuclear plant is going to be. There could be a big enough crowd on the streets that this SUV won't be able to push through them. But I'd be willing to bet that thing would. Wrangle nodded. That's a good eye, he commended. But let's hope it doesn't come to that. We have at least another hour of drive time ahead of us, he checked his watch, and was starting to cut it close. He turned back so they were parallel with the highway and continued to push on. They reached the end of the neighborhood, seeing a small sign pointing in both directions, one for the highway and the other for a shopping district. Unless anybody has any other detours, I'm going to get us back on track, Wrangle said. And when nobody answered, he nodded. Okay, back to the highway it is. He made the turn, and the zombies got a little thicker as they pushed on. They reached the highway, hopping on the road on the other side of the pileup that had forced them to go around. Only the zombies were a lot thicker on this side than previously, so thick that Wrangle wasn't sure they could push through it. He looked ahead and saw there were a break in the concrete barriers, which would allow him to get the SUV to the other side where it was less packed. All right, everybody, hang on, he said, and revved the engine a bit before flooring it. The SUV picked up speed, the noise drawing the zombies towards them and towards the opening in the highway median. Everybody hung on as they got close, the speed approaching a dangerous level. We're gonna hit, Wrangle cried, and smacked into several zombies as they approached the opening. The impact was enough to throw them a bit off course, so that the driver's side of the SUV scraped against the barrier, sending an ear-splitting sound through the air, as well as a few sparks. Wrangle managed to get them through to the other side, slamming on the brakes as he tried to regain control of the vehicle. Finally he managed to do so, but not before having a flood of zombies pouring through the opening, as well as congregating on the highway in front of them. "'Better get a move on, Sarge,' Reed urged. Wrangle floored it, and they sped off but he was forced to slam on the brake shortly thereafter. "'What the hell is happening up there?' Cohen groaned, peeking around the front seat and spotting the issue. There were dozens of zombies, as well as a line of cars that were blocking the road. It wasn't a major pile-up like the previous one, but the road was entirely blocked. Only this time, there was a mob of zombies coming up behind them. "'Right side!' Reed cried. Wrangle looked over at the two cars that had spun out, resting front end to front end with nothing behind them. This thing's got enough power to push through it, but it's going to take some time, Wrangle said, glancing in the rear view. Garrett, Preston, start slowing that mob down behind us. Garrett and Preston crawled into the back of the SUV, quickly working on the back window to get it open. As they worked, Wrangle drove them up towards the weak spot in the wreck. Reed rolled down his window, pulling his handgun and firing a couple of times, managing to hit two zombies directly in their path. "'Get ready for a stutter stop,' Wrangle warned. Preston and Garrett steadied themselves with their rifles aimed out the back window, not firing until they were stable. As soon as they felt the front end of the SUV make contact with the cars, they aimed and began firing at the mob behind them. There were hundreds of zombies that were headed their way, a good forty or fifty yards away. They stretched across the road, but were slanted in their direction, creating a semicircle of doom marching towards them. Spread out your headshots, every other zombie, Garrett instructed. Got it, Preston replied. The two soldiers fired quickly but deliberately, hitting headshot after headshot, dropping zombies and creating a bit of a log jam as the ones behind them tripped up. It didn't buy them a lot of time, but every second counted. Wrangle, meanwhile, floored the SUV, the engine screaming under the strain of it. The front end pushed against the center of the two other cars' hoods. After several moments, they began to move, the tires screeching along the pavement as they were forced out of the way. The two men in the back continued to fire their rifles, 
Garrett shot several bullets quickly before the gun clicked empty. I'm out, he cried. Cohen scrambled to look through a bag at his feet, pulling out a mag and handing it back. Mag, he cried. Garrett took it and slammed it in, racking around into the chamber and beginning to fire again. The mob was within twenty yards now, and moving way too quickly for their liking. Get a move on, Wrangle, Garrett cried. Wrangle glanced in the side mirror at the mass of rotting flesh headed their way. Screw it, he muttered, and floored it, risking the engine blowing, but without another choice. If that mob surrounded them, they'd be sitting ducks with no avenue of escape. Luckily, the added bit of power boosted the SUV forward. As the cars in front of him parted, he turned the wheel so they were pushing mostly on one vehicle, making it easier to get it out of the way. Come on, come on, come on! he chanted, and finally the car was just out of the way enough for them to squeak through. We're through, he cried, breaking out and putting some distance between them and the mob. The road in front of them on the way out of town was fairly clear, and everybody in the vehicle let out a sigh of relief. Well, that was fun, Garrett drawled, sarcasm high in his tone, and he and Preston lowered their rifles from firing position. They took it easy as they watched the mob disappear into the distance behind them. We better hope we don't have to come back here, Preston said, pulling out his mag and seeing that it was empty. That was a hell of a lot of ammo out the window. Literally, Garrett quipped. Preston rolled his eyes but couldn't stop the chuckle coming out of his mouth. Private, you make another cornball joke like that and you're walking, Reed said from the passenger seat. Really? Garrett piped up. After I carried your ass through the woods? Reed glanced back at him. Why do you think you got a warning? He asked. Garrett laughed along with the rest of the men. A much needed tension breaker. All right, everybody, get settled in, Wrangle finally said. We'll be at the overlook before you know it. A seriousness fell over the vehicle. After this nightmare of a trip, the exhaustion, the losses, everything, they were nearly at their target. Wrangle took a moment to appreciate that fact, but paused when it hit him that it just meant that the mission was getting started. Chapter 8 24 Hours Remain The back road to the Overlook was littered with cars, but none were actually on the road. It was a tiny two-lane road that wove through the hilly area. The men were tense, knowing they were close but also afraid to see what they'd find. Wrangle stopped the SUV just before they reached the entrance sign of the Overlook. Cars scattered about, but no sign of zombies. The driveway stretched another fifty yards or so over the trees. They could see an opening up ahead, but it was difficult to see what was up there. Garrett, Preston, Cohen, Wrangle said. Check it out. The three of them nodded and opened the doors, pouring out of the SUV. Wrangle stopped them at the side of the vehicle. If it's manageable, clear out the threat, he instructed. If it's not, see if you can get eyes on the target. It'll be nice to have full intel and a chance to plan, but at this point any info is valuable. Garrett nodded as he led the trio up the driveway. All three of them pulled out blades, getting them ready. As they walked, movement echoed in the woods around them. Cohen, two o'clock, Garrett said softly. Cohen stepped up and stabbed a zombie in the forehead, dropping it quickly. Cohen started to backpedal slowly as two more ghouls came out from the trees. Preston stepped up and the duo took care of them together. The trio continued to work their way up the driveway, getting a better view of the clearing, and not liking what they were seeing. Garrett motioned for them to take cover in the trees just off of the side of the drive. They took a knee and looked out. There were a dozen cars in the lot, and a couple dozen zombies spread out fairly thin, wandering in between the vehicles. A guardrail stood on the other side of the cars that were still intact. The slope of the driveway and the lot was slightly uphill, so they couldn't see anything other than sky on the other side. Looks like people wanted to spend the end of the world with a nice view, Cohen murmured. Better than spending it in gridlock on the interstate, Preston mused. Cohen nodded. No doubt, he said. Garrett surveyed the situation, spotting a couple of sedans on the right side that would be easy to get on top of. There were only a couple of ghouls on that side, with the bulk to the left. 
Cohen, you think you can get to those sedans over there? He asked, pointing. Cohen nodded. Easily, he replied. Good, Garrett said. Get there and start making a racket. Preston and I will be on cleanup duty. We'll start hitting them from behind as they move to you. Don't worry about taking anything down, just hold their attention. Cohen nodded and got ready to move. Go, Garrett said, and the private leapt from cover, sprinting hard towards the cars. His footsteps drew the attention of most of the zombies in the lot, including the few directly in his path. He lowered his shoulder and ploughed through the first one. However, he was tripped up by it and face-planted on the ground a few yards away from the next one that was making a beeline towards him. Shit, Garrett hissed. Follow the plan, Preston. He leapt up, drawing his handgun and firing several rounds at the zombie that was bearing down on Cohen, managing to hit it in the head. Unfortunately, this also had the side effect of drawing all the attention to him. Garrett quickly looked around, seeing a small path straight through the mob towards some more vehicles. Without thinking, he started running, hoping to break through them. As he ran, Cohen regained his footing and immediately began making noise on his way to the target car. This pulled a few zombies on his side of the parking lot in his direction. This helped Garrett push through the mob, allowing him to get to a car unscathed. He pulled himself up to the roof of a sedan, taking a knee to catch his breath as zombies flooded the area around him. He looked over to Cohen, who was on top of his vehicle. You're good? Garrett asked. Cohen gave him a thumbs up and a nod. All right, Preston, it's your show now. Garrett said with a glance back at the woods, and motioned to Cohen, who had four zombies near him. The rest of the throng was congregating around Garrett himself. Help Cohen clear his, then you two get over here. Preston gave a thumbs up and emerged from the trees, moving quickly but silently across the parking lot, making sure to keep to the rear of the zombies so he was out of sight. Once he was within striking range, it didn't take long for him to destroy the four ghouls. Good job, Garrett said. Now I want you two to flank this group. That way if they start coming your way, it'll spread them out further. The two soldiers nodded and quietly got into position before beginning to strike. All the while Garrett stood on top of the sedan, banging his boot on the roof and letting out whistles and yells. One by one the duo struck down zombies, but it didn't take long for the mob to catch on. One creature fell, bumping into the ghoul in front of it, setting off a domino effect through the crowd. This got their attention, turning them around. Garrett started directing traffic from his vantage point. Okay, both of you, start backing up, he instructed. Preston, off to your left. Go in the right. Get to a roof, but keep them following you. Both soldiers taunted the creatures as they backpedaled in their respective directions. As this happened, Garrett looked down at the few remaining ghouls that were more interested in him than anybody else. While I do appreciate your interest, he drawled, I'm going to have to politely decline your dinner invitation. He took a knee, inching closer to the edge of the roof. The zombie hands reached for him, grasping at his pants, but not with enough strength to pull him down. He jammed his knife into the top of a skull, ripping it free and systematically stabbing each of them, one by one. Soon the area around his car was clear, and the others were firmly surrounded by other ghouls, with a few stragglers left in the lot. Garrett hopped down and went to work, quickly making his way through the lot, taking the stragglers down in a similar fashion. He worked his way over to Preston, who had four creatures by him, and the two of them made quick work of the group before joining forces to clear the rest. Within minutes, the lot was free and clear of zombies. What do you say, boys? Garrett asked. Want to take a glimpse at the target before we get the others? Hell yeah, we do, Cohen quipped. The trio walked over to the guardrail that overlooked the area. The first thing they saw was the ocean, a beautiful glittering sight, shimmering blue water waves crashing on the rocks. But soon that image was ruined by movement on the beach. All three men gaped at the thousands of ghouls milling about, attracted by the sound of the waves forever left to bake in the California sun. They looked north towards the nuclear plant, still struck completely silent. After a few moments of blank staring, Garrett finally found his voice. Preston, he said hoarsely, go back to Wrangell. Get him now. 
Preston didn't move, still staring towards the plant. Preston! Garrett barked. The private swallowed hard, backing away slowly, unblinking. Yeah, I'll... I'll get him, he stammered, and only when he backed into a car did he finally tear his eyes away and turn, running back to the others. Cohen and Garrett continued to stare into the abyss of death. From their vantage point, they could see a couple of miles worth of interstate, with the nuclear plant about half a mile from where they were. The entire stretch of road was covered with shambling corpses. They were packed shoulder to shoulder, densely between cars and concrete barriers. Even the side street leading up to the plant entrance was hidden beneath the zombies covering it. How in the holy hell are we supposed to do this? Cohen moaned. Garrett couldn't answer, still completely staggered, unable to respond. Garrett? Cohen begged. His companion shook his head. I'll be honest, he said hoarsely. I don't have the first fucking clue. Chapter 9 Everyone stood at the guardrail, shoulder to shoulder, staring at the impossible target. For several minutes they stood silent, just soaking it all in. Even though the interstate was a quarter mile away at the closest point, and down quite a ways, the moaning from the collected mass of ghouls still echoed up to them. Well, Reed finally said, this is less than ideal. Thank you for gracing us with your infinite wisdom, Corporal, Garrett said, drawing out each word with over-exaggerated sarcasm. That made my life risking all the more worth it. Sergeant, do you still have that night vision scope? Charlie asked. Wrangle nodded, pulling it out of a pocket and clicking off the night vision since the sun was still out. Charlie took it and looked through before finding the zoom and changing it to the maximum before staring through it again. What are you looking for? Garrett asked. Give me a minute, Charlie replied. Garrett nodded, letting the doctor do his thing. He looked through the scope, scanning the side road leading up to the gates. Son of a bitch, he muttered. Okay, when one of us says it, it's bad, Cohen piped up. But when the expert says it, my pucker level goes to eleven. As it should, Charlie quipped. Okay, now it's a twelve, Cohen said. What's the problem? Wrangle asked. Charlie held out the scope. Look at the gate to the plant, he instructed. The sergeant took the scope and held it up to his eyes, running up the road to the gates, stopping and staring at them for several moments, before lowering his arm. Son of a bitch, he said. Okay, someone want to fill us in? Garrett asked, voice rising a notch. The gates are open, Charlie said flatly. There was a long silence as the group let that information sink in. So... Even if we can get to the compound, we're going to have thousands of those things to deal with, just to get to the door, the doctor continued. Assuming those haven't been breached too, Preston pointed out. For all we know, someone tried to take refuge there and just wasn't quick enough to get it secured. Cohen threw up his hands. Come on, let's try and think positive here, he said. Trust me, I am being positive, Preston snapped. Cohen opened his mouth to retort, but then seemed to think better of it, closing it again. So what in the hell are we going to do? Reed asked. It's not like turning back at this point is an option. We have, what, less than twenty-four hours before that thing goes into meltdown? Wrangle checked his watch, nodding helplessly. I'm open to ideas, he said. We have that big-ass dump truck from the last town we passed through, Charlie said, jerking a thumb over his shoulder. It should have enough oomph to get us through the mob. And then what? Cohen asked. How do you propose we deal with the thousands of those things in the courtyard? Or get through the front doors? Charlie shook his head emphatically. I don't know, but we need to think of something and think of it quickly. That town was big enough that it's gotta have some shops, Garrett suggested. Rig up some bombs or something? Flamethrowers, maybe? Preston rolled his eyes. What a great idea. Let's set the nuclear power plant on fire, he bellowed. Okay, maybe not flamethrowers, Garrett replied sheepishly. But surely we can rig something up to clear away the front door. 
at least long enough for us to get inside. Reed pursed his lips, taking in a deep breath as he contemplated shaking his head. Okay, say we get through the horde and can get inside, he piped up. Then what? We fix the problem, Garrett replied slowly. What else is there? Reed pointed to his bite. For me, there's absolutely nothing because of this thing, he said firmly. But I assume you boys want to live to see tomorrow. If so, there needs to be an exit strategy, because right now, I'm sure as shit not seen a viable one. An uncomfortable silence fell over the men as they glanced around at each other, realizing he was right. Shit. Pushing through that crowd is a one-way trip, Cohen finally blurted. Unless we can all crowd into the cab of that dump truck and park it right beside the front door. Charlie shook his head. Unlikely to work, he said. I haven't seen this facility, but just about every single one of them has security doors. They open outwards, and if they're closed, it means we're going to have to blow them open. All eyes turned to the doctor. You want to repeat that one, Charlie? Preston said, warning in his tone as if he were demanding his companion say something different. If the doors are shut, we're going to have to blow them open, Charlie repeated. These facilities were hardened in recent years, and they're a bitch to get into. Unless, of course, they're already open, in which case we have an entirely different set of problems to deal with. Yeah, hundreds of problems, Garrett muttered. Or thousands. Preston raised a hand. What about a helicopter? he asked. Reed blinked at him. What about a helicopter? he shot back. Can we land one on the roof and get inside that way? Preston replied. Wrangle nodded thoughtfully. What about it, Cohen? he asked. Can you fly a chopper? Assuming we can find one, of course. Cohen held out his hand for the scope and then looked towards the plant. After a moment, he shook his head. That's a no-go, he said. Why? Preston asked. More security measures, Cohen explained. There's a ton of wires running over the compound so a direct landing isn't an option. Only thing that could do it would be a rescue chopper, something with a tow line or repelling line. Hell, what am I saying? It would have to be a tow line for the extraction, he scoffed. Unless you guys want to free climb 50 yards of rope that's flying through the air. Sounds better than driving through that mob, Preston muttered. Garrett shook his head. But where in the hell we find a rescue chopper, he demanded, and not only find one, but find one that's fueled up and ready to fly. I don't know, but I'm willing to look, Preston declared. Realistically, we're not going to find one, especially in the time frame we have, Cohen said with an apologetic shrug. The closest military base is on the other side of the interstate, so we'd need the truck anyway, and most likely the rescue choppers were taken with the ships, or stolen, and I don't know where the next closest airport is. The men's shoulders all slumped, except for Charlie. He nodded to himself, a smile growing on his face. Preston glared at him. What part of this makes you happy? He snapped. A helicopter extraction just might be viable, Charlie replied. Man, I've heard of selective hearing before, but come on, Preston groaned. No, not right now, Charlie amended, raising a hand. A few weeks from now, maybe. Reed cocked his head. What are you talking about? He asked. I know I'm not in the loop for a lot of the military plans, especially since I'm just a civilian, the doctor began. But it doesn't take a genius to know that the military picked the Northwest because of its close proximity to the Canadian oil fields and the refinement plants outside of Seattle, right? Wrangle nodded. A team was sent out to Canada a few days ago, he said. I don't know if they were successful or not, but the brass seemed happy, so I can assume that they were. What I don't know is how that helps us. When we get to the command console, I'll have the ability to communicate with the people back in Seattle, Charlie explained. Once they get the fuel going, they can send a ship with a rescue chopper in a few weeks. All we have to do is make sure to pack enough food and water so we can ride out the weight. Preston barked out a laugh. God, I do love your optimism, he mocked. Look around us, man. Do you really think they're going to burn that much fuel for a sergeant and a handful of privates? Face it, man, we're expendable. Charlie smirked, opting for a smug tone to match the dismissive mocking from the soldier. I have a PhD in nuclear engineering, and am most certainly one of the foremost experts in the world on the topic, he said, raising his chin. 
and depending on who of my colleagues have managed to survive, I very well could be the most knowledgeable person in the world when it comes to nuclear power and power plants. He crossed his arms. You may be expendable, Private, but I'm sure as hell not. If you're nice, though, I'll make sure they have a seat for you on the ride back to the boat. He gave the soldier a condescending wink, which caused the rest of the soldiers to break into laughter at his expense. To his credit, Preston eventually smiled and nodded, knowing that Charlie had gotten one over on him. Wrangle looked at his watch again and sighed. The sun was starting to set to the west, giving them only another hour at most of sunlight. He took a deep breath. We have twenty-three hours and change left, he said. We have to haul ass back to that town for the truck and hope those shops haven't been ransacked. Garrett, you and Preston are on weapons. We're going to need explosives. Both meant to harm and meant to distract. Also going to need something that can take down security doors. Cohen, Reed, you're on food detail. Need enough for each man to survive a month with rationed care. Focus on the food, Charlie added. The command centers of these plants are designed with security in mind. There's most likely a washroom attached, so we should have water as they would have their own water treatment. That way, once someone is checked in, they're in. Preston raised an eyebrow. And if they don't? he asked. Charlie shrugged. Then we're screwed, he replied. But given how much water you'd need to carry to keep us alive for a month, that would be too much to deal with, especially in a combat situation. Okay, washroom it is, Preston grunted. Wrangle paused for a moment, waiting for anybody else to speak. Nobody did. Okay, boys, he said, clapping his hands together. Saddle up. We have a hell of a night ahead of us. The End